since now you know about antigenic drifts and shifts we can see that a causes all the pandemics b can cause epidemics and c is endemic what i have written additionally in front of b is that b is also associated with a disproportionate cases of reyes syndrome and gastric flu what is gastric flu gastric flu is the presence of gastric symptoms so out of all these three a b and c b can cause gastric symptoms and therefore it has been named as a virus causing gastric flu something different so you should know and reyes syndrome reyes syndrome is the acute encephalopathy plus the fatty degeneration of the liver so that is reyes syndrome if a patient of influenza again takes aspirin he may have a reyes syndrome wherein he has coma convulsions and such encephalopathy kinds of presentation plus he has a fatty liver so that is reyes syndrome which is also associated with b currently circulating viruses there is uh, no shortcut here unfortunately what we'll have to do is that we'll have to remember this and at least the important ones currently we have circulating h1n1 we have n3n2 we have b and we have this newly discovered h5n1 out of all these i am sure you remember h5n1 because this is fairly new and this this made global highlights very recently as far as h1n1 is concerned the latest epidemic of influenza that we have or rather the pandemic of influenza that we have is of the a variety so h1n1 is the latest virus which has caused the global pandemic the latest pandemic is because of h1n1 so a definitive should know and you can see that the pandemic started in 2009 and it started off in mexico sometimes this may also be asked the pandemic started in mexico it was h1n1 what is the most recent virus you have h5n1 so these are two different things most recently discovered is h5n1 pandemic most recent is h1n1 source source you have reservoirs in animals and birds cases and subclinical secretions of all sorts of things you know animals birds human beings you have all these viruses dispersed everywhere in nature and therefore we saw that they mate with each other and form new beings so this is source is very diverse for influenza infectivity you have secretions in nasopharynx which are infectious and i have bolded there two days prior to the onset to two days after the onset of the disease that is the period of infectivity features so what are the features of influenza you have sudden onset because of short incubation period you have a large subclinical portion high susceptible population short immunity and absence of cross immunity so basically a very congenial atmosphere for disease outburst because of all these things because of all these features the disease simply bursts out because there is no immunity and the disease spreads very fast you have chills malaise fever muscular pain and cough nothing really special there these are all normal symptoms of many viral conditions demography again nobody is spared but you have a specific high risk group what are the high risk groups above 65 years of age children below 1.5 years of age patients of diabetes mellitus patients of coronary heart disease renal disease and respiratory disease all of them would be high risk groups for influenza immunity is subtype specific and there is immunity against these two antigens that we discussed on the very first slide remember them you had megalutinin antibody and neuraminidase antibody so those two were antigens on the first slide and now we are talking about their respective antibodies hemagglutinin antibody resists the initiation of infection and neuraminidase prevents the severity and the transmission of the disease so what is happening here is that they are attacking two different modes of disease spread one is stopping initiation and the other one is stopping the spread transmission we saw already that it is transmitted through droplet nuclei and droplet infection sneezing coughing talking all these are common modes of transmission 
incubation period is 18 to 72 hours and clinical features you have inflammation and necrosis of the superficial epithelium cough and fever what are the complications in complications you have pneumonia and one more important MCQ here Streptococcus pneumonia is the most common complicating organism as far as pneumonia in influenza is concerned so if you have a secondary bacterial infection on a case of influenza the causative organism most commonly would be Streptococcus pneumoniae could be asked in my subject could also be asked in microbiology you can have a worsening of pre-existing COPD so chronic obstructive pulmonary disease if somebody is having that can be exaggerated you can have of, of course Reyes syndrome and you can have GBS GBS is Guillain Barre syndrome for lab investigations you can have virus isolation from the specimens of the nasopharynx what is done is hemagglutination inhibition test and ELISA out of these two I should say tell you ELISA is more sensitive so ELISA is more sensitive out of HI and ELISA and pair seras can be used usually a fourfold rise of antibody titer is taken to be of diagnostic value how do we prevent influenza everybody knows that vaccines are available and making these vaccines is a huge task which is an ongoing task you have killed vaccines which are commonly used and the mode of application is subcutaneous you have very recently developed live attenuated vaccine in the form of nose drops so this is new can be tested you have nose drops vaccine for influenza in fact this is probably the first vaccine which is marketed in a nose drop preparation and it is as good as the earlier vaccines and confers local immunity also in the newer vaccines you have split virus vaccine neuraminidase specific vaccine and the recombinant vaccine but what is really special is this newly developed trivalent nose drop vaccine chemoprophylaxis again has been revised so the older chemoprophylaxis and treatment schedule has just got a brush up what we now use for type A is Zanamivir or if Zanamivir is not available you can use or very old Remantidine for B you have Ostel Tamivir so this is used for B for treatment you have for type A you have Zanamivir or if that is not available the other two drugs for B if you have uh, a infection with type B you, you use Ostelmivir and Zanamivir so these are the drugs basically if you see the drugs used for chemoprophylaxis and treatment are almost the same so they are same for both chemoprophylaxis as well as the treatment the drugs are a bit tricky what we are used to is Remantadine and Amantadine 100 milligram now these are the new drugs which have come into the play and therefore you should know these also with that we finish influenza and we move on to another disease of a very big public health importance and that is leprosy leprosy is truly a social disease it is truly a social stigma leprosy is one of the first diseases that was known to mankind it is one of the first diseases about which we have some records and it is also one of the diseases which is attributed to God's wrath still in major parts of India people believe that leprosy is not a disease it is a God's curse and therefore these patients are abandoned there is nobody to look after them and these people are outcast so let us see what leprosy is and how it is not a God's curse the cardinal features of leprosy highly testable you have hypopigmented patches you have thickened nerves you have loss of sensation in the area of the nerve and you have presence of acid fast bacilli in the smears these are cardinal features of leprosy hypopigmented patches loss of sensation thickened nerves and lastly presence of acid fast bacilli let me remind you here mycobacterium leprosy is the brother of mycobacterium tuberculosis so mycobacteria the, the family is same they are both mycobacteria they share a lot of properties in fact if you have been suffering from tuberculosis you will have a positive lepromin test they have a lot of antigens which are common 
both being mycobacteria would be rich in mycolic acid so they have a lot of things in common agent factor we have mycobacterium leprae which is acid fast like mycobacterium tuberculosis you can see characteristics clumps or bundles called as globi and if you remember your microbiology this looks like a pack of cigarettes if you look at it head on so if you look at the pack of cigarettes like this the, the stack you that you see the globi looks like that in the microscopy slide and they have affinity to schwann cells this explains why they attack nerves schwann cells what are schwann cells these are cells which provide insulation to your axons your nerves so these are the cells which provide insulation and therefore help in conduction remember your physiology so schwann cells mycobacterium leprae is attracted towards schwann cells disrupts these cells disrupts conduction and therefore causes neurological problems they remain dormant in many sites and cause relapse again have you heard this somewhere tuberculosis tuberculosis remains dormant leprosy also remains dormant and can cause relapse bacterial load is of course highest in lepto lepromatous cases and is the least or it is absent in tuberculoid cases now what is this lepromatous and tuberculoid we'll be seeing that in great detail but let me tell you just now lepromatous is the is the bottom line for leprosy worst case scenario as far as leprosy is concerned tuberculoid is the best case scenario for leprosy so tuberculoid leprosy is the best of leprosy and lepromatous is the worst of leprosy so these are the spectrums of leprosy bacterial load so therefore is commonly seen in lepromatous it is highest disseminated seen leprosy is seen in nine banded armadillos recently i should tell you it is not only seen in nine banded armadillos as we used to believe till now very recently it has been confirmed that some chimpanzees and other monkey species also harbor leprosy plus there are some new hosts so leprosy is again going to trouble us for a lot lot more than we initially thought we initially thought that only armadillos have leprosy now we know a lot of other man animals also have and we can get the disease so it's not a very easy disease now subclinical infections are also the source and can be troublesome all cases with active leprosy should be considered infectious now there is a lot of debate i don't want to drag you into the debate the bottom line is emboldened on your slide all cases with active leprosy should be considered infectious if you remember this you really cut down your work a lot coming to the agent factors sneezing blowing your nose discharges a lot of bacilli broken skin of the patients can directly transmit the bacteria to your skin and the infectivity leprosy is another unique disease of epidemiology leprosy is highly infectious but the pathogenicity of the disease is very low now for those of you who have already forgot what infectivity and pathogenicity means this is a time to recap this is a time to go back and clear this out with a real example leprosy is a disease i say which is highly infectious but it has got a very low pathogenicity which automatically means that leprosy spreads very fast good leprosy spreads very fast but it cannot cause disease it cannot cause disease and there is a difference there is a difference between infection and disease and this is what leprosy is a very good example of that criteria leprosy spreads very fast okay but it cannot cause disease so leprosy is highly infectious but the pathogenicity is less okay and what would be the virulence then there was a third factor we discussed virulence what would be the virulence common sense tells me if the pathogenicity is less obviously the virulence should be very very less so how can a disease which has got low pathogenicity be virulent it has got to be first pathogenic and then virulent so leprosy is highly infectious low pathogenicity and almost no virulence or a very very low virulence treatment with dapsone and rifampicin is done what you need to take home is 
that in three weeks, if you treat with rifampicin, the patient becomes non-infectious, very very high yield, can be tested, will be tested. Treatment with rifampicin for a patient of leprosy will make the patient non-infectious within three weeks. Otherwise, the patient is infectious for a very very long time. Rifampicin is a magic drug as far as leprosy is concerned and infectiousness would drop to almost zero in three weeks. Host factors, it is highly infectious especially in the group of 10 to 20. If child population has infection, it shows that the infection is active and spreading. Why am I telling you this? Because this is used as an indicator for programmatic success. So we measure the success or failure of our current status by this. If the ch children of the society are getting affected, we know that the infection is a big problem. It is very much alive and kicking and it is spreading. It is obviously higher in males because males go out, have more contact with other people and environmental factors supported. Mycobacterium tubercul uh, Mycobacterium leprae is one of those notorious bacteria which can live outside the human body for a very long time. Moist soil is a very good place for the Mycobacterium leprae to live and therefore it, it, it can sustain outside the human body also for extended periods of time. It is again transmitted by droplet nuclei or direct skin contact as we already saw. Indirect contact and formites is unfortunately also possible. As I said, the bacteria is present in the soil, formites can harbor it. It is heavily present in the nasal discharges of lepromatous patient and also on the skin ulcers that they have. So bacterial load is not a concern, it is rampant everywhere and therefore modes of transmission are also plenty as you can see. Incubation period, please wake up, very very important, it's years, 3 to 5 years, this is not hours, this is not months, this is not days, I am talking about an incubation period which expands in years, the incubation period of leprosy is 3 to 5 years. That means 3 to 5 years ago you came in contact with a lepromatous patient and now you have got signs of leprosy. So it is a very long incubation period. It may be even more for lepromatous patients. And the incubation period is successively short for tuberculoid patients. Coming to, as I promised you, we will look at what lepromatous and tuberculoid and stuff like that are. You have right now on your screens the classification of leprosy, you have two types, the Indian classification and the Madrid classification. These are the two most commonly used classifications and I have bolded here pure neuritic type because that is the only difference between these two. Otherwise both have intermediate tuberculoid borderline lepromatous and this is a speciality of the Indian classification, pure neuritic type. Now what is this pure neuritic? Pure neuritic type of leprosy is a type of leprosy wherein only a single nerve involvement is present. There is no other clinical feature. A single nerve is thickened and no problem otherwise. That is a pure neuritic type of leprosy. This is only included in the Indian classification. As I already told you, tuberculoid is the so called best type of leprosy and lepromatous is the worst type of leprosy. Coming to the WHO classification, WHO classifies leprosy as possibacillary and multibacillary. The, the differentiation is right now on your slides. What is important is that the bacterial index is less than 2 in possibacillary and there are 5 or less lesions in possibacillary and the reverse is true in multibacillary. Now this BI or bacteriological index is a new entity. Diagnosis. You have clinical examination, of course you have bacteriological examination, you have foot pad culture and histamine test not very frequently used. You can have a biopsy and there are some new immunological tests that have come into play right now. You have the lepromin test, the old one and the humoral responses test which are the fairly new one. Coming to the bacteriological index or the bacterial index that I was telling you. You have this classification, those of you who can afford to remember this may remember this, those of you who cannot afford to remember this could forget this because I know that in the examination you have got a lot of things to remember. I cannot ask you to remember the whole of community medicine and therefore I say those of you who can 
it's good those of you who really think that it is pretty confusing you can leave it off what you should know but is the conclusion or the take home message that is bi less than 2 is passive bacillary by the who definition and the bi more than 2 is multi bacillary according to the who definition why am i classifying again for treatment if i have this classification before me i can also arrange for the treatment accordingly the second thing that you should know regarding leprosy sometimes asked is the morphological index there is a debate on this let us not go there but you should know what a morphological index is morphological index basically tells you the number of viable living bacteria amongst the whole group say you have 100 many of them are not active or they are dead so morphological index tells me what proportion of the bacteria are alive and kicking and can cause harm to me so percentage of solid staining bacteria in a smear is morphological index what i do is that i add the morphological index for individual slides and i divide it by the number of slides so basically i take an average and i get my morphological index the criteria for morphological index to be counted into morphological index is the bacteria must be uniform staining it must have parallel sides it must have rounded edges and the length should be at least 5 times that of bread if you see this compositely it is not very difficult to have a long slender uniformly staining bacteria with rounded edges so that is how it should be so you have if that is there that it is counted into a morphological index coming to lepromin test lepromin test was a very important test is not very important right now but the implications are very important at the outset let me tell you lepromin test is not a diagnostic test the most common mistake all of us make and will continue to make is lepromin test is not a diagnostic test for leprosy it does a lot of things but it does not diagnose leprosy for that matter a person who comes from a country where leprosy is not existent an alien may be who comes tomorrow to planet earth and he is new to planet earth may have a positive lepromin test lepromin test does a lot of things but it does not tell you whether the person is infected with leprosy you have two kinds of reaction in lepromin test the first one is an early reaction which is the fernandes reaction and the second one is the mitsuda reaction 